Totalitarian, Part 4 36. Rogue It was an unusually hot day for autumn, and the sun shined on a courtyard in central London. Three rows of houses faced each other, and in the centre was a beautiful round fountain. A crowd of approaching nearly a thousand people gathered, mingling together, waiting in anticipation. They had travelled to see their saviour. The young tiptoed on the cobbles, trying to grab a glimpse of their heroine, and the taller waved and cheered. La co, la co, la co, they chanted as they waited for her to appear. Her name made them feel alive. At the back of the crowd lingered a lone man. His face was stiff and didn't fit the jubilation that surrounded him. He stuck out like a rip on a wedding dress, a problem on something perfect. His eyes seemed heavy and a half crescent of darkness hung below them. A thin red scarf covered his nose and lips, making his eyes more mysterious as he watched. Around a grey hoodie was a thick grey blanket wrapped around him like a toga. He wore three-quarter beige cargo pants, and on his feet were old brown leather sandals. It was Iram. He looked broken. Once brilliant green eyes were now a sewage green. Behind the scarf was thick stubble. His boyish charm had vanished. Life once seemed so wonderful, so much to look forward to. Now he shuddered at the time he had left, looking at life like a gaping pit, falling deeper every day. Intrigued by the event before him, he leaned forward towards a man who was close by. What's happening? said Iram, as the middle-aged man gave him a look that said, Are you for real? It's the coal. Apparently she's going to be here, said the man, like he was reminding Iram of something he already knew. Who? You know, said the man trying to get a better view. Iram didn't have time to reply. A great cheer went up from the crowd, like a sporting hero had landed on home soil after winning an international tournament. It lasted longer than he expected, at least a minute before the crowd subsided. The coal stepped on a temporary stage, market stalls pulled together. She stood on wood panels and looked at the biggest crowd she had seen so far. Her brown hair was tied back. She wore a white vest top with army camo trousers tucked into big black boots, laced up to her knee. It was becoming her signature look. She was aware of the image she portrayed, a beautiful soldier. It resonated with her audience. She breathed in deeply, trying to kill the butterflies in her stomach for good. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming, she shouted. The crowd gave her a round of applause, then subsided to absolute silence. I'm here to deliver a message, but first things first. Well done. Those bastards in the palace don't know what's happening shouted Le Col. The crowd gave a mighty cheer and fell silent again. We wait, said Le Col, crouching down as if she was a stage actor. We hide, she said, getting lower. And then one day, we strike, shouted Le Col, jumping up, forcing her fist closed to the sky. The crowd erupted even louder than before. Our heart is ten times stronger, ten times more honest than those so-called men. The coal fed her audience words, making them stronger. She reinforced her message about always being on the alert, on the network and the station. And through gleaming smiles, the coal could see they were happy. She gracefully left, waving goodbye and taking a bow, leaving with Chirac, leaving the crowd with optimism. The majority of the crowd disappeared, but pockets of people remained and chatted. They spoke of the coal, of their brightening future while sipping on hot coffee and soup in paper cups that a man nearby handed out for free. Clouds had gathered and the sunshine was replaced by a cooler winds, and soon people's thoughts turned to home. Iran was sitting on a bench. In front of him was a man sipping on hot tomato soup. Its colour matched his beard and hair. His thinning ginger hair reminded Iran of a Van Gogh self-portrait. It wasn't just his hair. His clothes looked ragged, like he'd been sleeping on the streets. But the man's face showed an underlying joy. People flock to see this woman. They think she's a revolution, asked Iram to the man, sipping on a soup. That's right. She's incredible. Amazing. Tells us where to be, where not to be. She offers us a chance, you know, said the man, taking another sip. You don't buy into that, do you? Look around. Who's going to fight? said Iram, frowning, taking down his scarf and revealing the rest of his tired-looking face. At least she's doing something, said the man. Why, though? She looks middle class, educated. Bet she has money. She doesn't have to be here. She doesn't want up us. 
Us, said the man, putting down his soup. <laughs> you just don't get it, do you? Get what? It starts in our minds first, he said, putting a finger to his temple. Don't be one of them. For your own sake, become a believer. The autumn hair had turned chilly, as though the sunshine had just appeared briefly for the coal. The ginger man put on his woolly hat, taken from his pocket, then handed Iram a leaflet with fingerless gloves and stood up. Iram gazed down at the leaflet as the man walked away. It was a picture of the coal standing majestically pointing towards the sky. The photographer was looking up with the sun behind her head, turning much of the coal into a silhouette as her hair fluttered in the wind. Below were two words, the answer. Iram stared at the words and felt cheated, wondering how people had been taken in by her lies. A jealousy coursed through him as he looked down at the smiles of the last people in the courtyard, wanting their joy and optimism. They saw the coal as a passage, leading them to a freedom. To Iram, she epitomised what was wrong, how a single person can gain power over so many. This woman could have it all, but instead she lived in exile with the masses. Iram didn't trust her. She was an insult and a reminder of what was wrong. In his eyes, she was a disgrace. 37. Buzz Iram wasn't the only person who looked down at that leaflet that day and felt disdain. Another man, in very different circumstances, looked down and felt rage. In a warm office, he sipped an old whiskey and tried to make sense of what he stared at. It was the Prime Minister. He listened to the crackle of the fire, then looked up at an army corporal he had known for years. Corporal Jones. It had been 20 years. The Prime Minister had joined the army the same time as Jones, but pursued a career in politics several years later. It had began as a rocky career, but when the country had been vulnerable, he had gathered its confidence. Now he found himself as Prime Minister, and it was only natural that Jones, who had done well in the military on his own accord, was to establish a special relationship with him. Mostly, this relationship did work in favour for Jones, but not today. The corporal had much to answer for. What is this? said the Prime Minister, glaring at his old acquaintance. Corporal Jones looked nervous. His eyes wouldn't meet the Prime Minister's. This nervous feeling was alien to Jones, as he tried to muster as much confidence as he could. It appears she's become a court figure to the local populace said Jones, sounding artificial like a robot. I can see that. The fact the vermin have a hero doesn't bother me, or that we're struggling to make them leave. What really gets to me is the matter of weeks ago. She was a prisoner. What the hell happened, Jones? It seems she escaped, said Jones, holding his hands together tightly behind his back. You're a genius, Jones, said the Prime Minister swiping away his whiskey glass, smashing it against the wall. Our report hasn't been put together yet, sir. Sorry, sir, said Jones. Don't give me that shit. What happened? said the Prime Minister, slamming his fist on the oak table. He grabbed the leaflet in his hand and scrunched it up. Sorry, sir, but I really don't know, said Jones. The worry in his stomach was evident in his words, sounding lifeless and empty. For a moment... The Prime Minister did nothing but stare at Jones. What else are you hiding from me? said the Prime Minister. Jones felt a grip around his lung, hesitating on his words. There is one other thing, said Jones, closing his eyes. The Prime Minister waited to hear what Jones had to say, trying to remain professional. It seems a high-profile soldier has gone missing. We have reason to believe he's working with the enemy. What's his name? said the Prime Minister. Harper, said Jones, swallowing hard. The Prime Minister shut his eyes, composing the irritation trying to claw its way out of him. He relaxed and breathed deeply, then stood up, walking around his desk. It doesn't seem like you've got a hand on this at all, does it? Not one, sir. Is that supposed to be funny? No, sir. I made a mistake. A mistake? said the Prime Minister, tilting his head sideways. The Prime Minister smiled. It was the smile of a madman. His lips opened, revealing perfect teeth. Jones didn't dare look away from the man he was sure was medically mad. But it's hard to diagnose the clever ones. 
He felt hypnotised by his blue eyes and confused by the sinister smile. The Prime Minister stood close, so Jones couldn't see the right hand that slipped under his jacket. He couldn't see the fingers around the metal handle of the pistol. The Prime Minister's smile widened as he rested his left hand on Jones's shoulder. Jones did not ease in front of the man he once called his friend. That man had disappeared a long time ago, sick from prejudice and power. The Prime Minister pointed the gun into Jones's stomach and pulled the trigger. A lone bullet ripped through his torso and split his spine. Oops, said the Prime Minister. Jones collapsed and held his body as blood dripped through his fingers. The Prime Minister turned back to his desk and put the gun in the top drawer. He then poured another whiskey. He looked at Jones and felt nothing, waiting for him to die. He listened to his moans. To him, it sounded beautiful. A little later, he then pressed the buzzer on his desk so someone could take away his corpse. 38. Carefree Harper walked the corridor to Cavill's flat feeling agitated. Something had changed within him. He had felt uneasy. Running and hiding wasn't natural to him, and he knew he had to speak to LeCole. Cavill's flat had changed a lot in the recent weeks. The neighbouring flats had been renovated to meet the resistance needs. The corridor and rooms had become a control centre, up of intelligence. The voice of the streets. LeCole was the resistance, a messenger keeping people safe. Harper, LeCole and Bella called Cowell's flat home, but Harper knew she would be there on business. He saw her sat there on the sofa with her laptop and coffee in hand. She looked up through black rimmed glasses, making her brown eyes look bigger. Her hair was down, still damp from the shower, and she smiled. Hello, Harry, said LeCole. You're beautiful, said Harper in his head. We need to talk. About what? she said, looking back at the computer screen. About what we're going to do. What do you mean? Nothing's going to change if we just keep hiding. This is a war. Wars aren't won on the internet. They aren't won by hiding, said Harper, with his hands on his waist in the centre of the room. And what do you want me to do? said the cold typing, not looking at Harper. Fight, said Harper, feeling frustrated with her lack of concern. No, said the cold bluntly. Harper had expected that, but not seen the carefree attitude. He had mentioned fighting the EE physically, about starting a real war with knives and guns, but she had hardly batted an eyelid. Was it ignorance or arrogance? Harper wondered, irritated, and continued to try to convince her. We could have ten, maybe twenty, who knows, maybe thirty thousand people outside Westminster. Put the word out. We're ready to fight. No, said the call again taking little interest in Harper. The coal. The nation's army is abroad. It's stretched overseas. All they have is the EE. I say we storm the gates of Westminster and demand an end to this madness, said Harper. I will not have innocent blood on my hands, said the coal, taking off her glasses, giving Harper a cold stir. Harper stepped closer and rested a hand on the armrest, leaning close to the coal. You will have innocent blood flooding the streets if you do nothing. We can't hide forever, said Harper, shaking his head and walking out the room. He went down the stairs of the building and headed for the exit, desperate for fresh air. 39. Saliva Harper walked the cobbled courtyard where the coal had made her speech a couple days earlier. He breathed in the cool air and felt the chill of winter approaching. He walked and smiled at the steady bustle of life. Market stalls sold vegetables and fruits. Others sold gloves and hats and bits and bobs. But as he looked closely, he saw something worrying he didn't want to see. But it was inevitable. The people were tired and desperate. They didn't ask for food, they shouted. People blew into their hands trying to keep themselves warm. Men had unkempt beards, ripped jeans and dirty tracksuit bottoms. Women wore rags with black fingernails, and some didn't have shoes. The atmosphere was desperate. He noticed a line of people waiting for soup rations. The call focused on their energy and provided a dream, but she hadn't noticed their desperation. Their life wasn't desirable, and Harper knew it needed to change. As the truth filtered through his mind, a vision of his own grew. 
Then he saw something that made him ache with disgust and cemented his new beliefs. He saw a boy no older than seven resting against a wall, shivering. His hair had been shaved. Dirt ran down his cheeks as he folded his arms tightly, conserving little energy he had. His pale blue t-shirt was covered in dirt. His bottoms were torn to the knee, revealing scabs. He wouldn't last long if nothing changed. As Harper approached the boy, he laid down and rested his head on the cold cobbles. Harper watched people step over him and felt disgusted. Harper took off his jacket and rested over the boy who smiled weakly. Harper realised he could be no older than Bella, who, then, would be in the comfort of a home maybe drinking hot chocolate and playing with her favourite teddy bear. Harper sneered at the thought that even amongst the rebels, a hierarchy still existed. As he looked down at the boy, it became clear. It had to change. An opportunity presented itself to Harper, and he wouldn't let it pass. He looked at the people growing weaker with every passing second. He looked to his side and noticed a man looking in a bad state with a red headscarf covering his face and a toga-like robe covering his body. He walked with a limp, like he was hurt, with a quick pace. Harper noticed his eyes were a shade of purple, shining with pain. The man barged into Harper as he walked by. Hey, said Harper as the man stumbled. It was Iram. He barged past another, then climbed frantically onto a market store crushing the owner's goods. Little plastic toys, lighters and sweets and batteries were kicked off by Aram, who turned to face the people in the market. What the hell is he doing? shouted the stall owner. Look at you, said Iram, as people stopped and stared. You disgust me. Sold a dream that lives only in your weak, feeble minds. Caged energy will only torment. I hope you're happy, said Iram, hissing and pointing at the people who had begun to gather. Harper approached with concern. Hey, come on, get down from there, said Harper with a wave, keeping it casual, not wanting to irritate the man any more. Iram gave Harper a slight glance but didn't care. You love your precious Lacole. Le well, ask yourself what's changed. We're here, living in squalor, while the woman watches, warm and wicked. Fools! Ha! Freedom, redemption, dignity? You lost it when you sold your soul to her. Ask yourself... What if the coal wins? <laughs> you know what it'll be like. Just another aristocracy on top. Looking at us rats below, said Iram, with a cackle, laughing as saliva dripped down his chin. The crowd began to boo, and a shoe was thrown, hitting him in the neck. The crowd laughed, and the stall owner grabbed his legs. He pulled him hard, sending his back crashing hard against the wooden stall. Several men dragged him off to the cobbled floor. A crowd moved in like vultures. They beat Iram, kicking and stamping. On the floor, Iran pulled out a blade from a leather holster on his belt and began to lash out at the crowd. There were gasps as everyone jumped back. Get back! Get back! said Iram. The crowd fell silent and Iram's sickening smile returned. But from behind the stall, the owner had taken a plank of wood. He crept up then smashed Iram in the head, sending him face first into the cobbles. The crowd was angry and they swooped in again, enraged at a man who had dared disgrace the coal's name. Harper pushed through the bodies. Stop it! Get off him! said Harper, shouting, worried the crowd might kill him. Some people in the crowd recognised Harper and stepped away as he came forward. The crowd fell silent, watching Harper help Iram. As Harper pulled him up, off the floor, Iram fell into him, coughing blood. And quickly, he slipped his hands into Harper's holster and took his gun discreetly, hiding it in the ruffles of his robe. Are you OK? said Harper, noticing the blood dripping from his nose. Iram felt trapped as the crowd encircled him. He spat in Harper's face then jolted, running through the crowd, laughing hysterically, heading out the courtyard with his awkward limp into the orange glow of a setting sun. The crowd looked at Harper as spit dripped down his cheek. He wiped it away and could feel the silence of the crowd and their watching eyes as he walked away. In a way, Harper could hear sense in Iram's speech. There was truth in his message. Harper headed back to the flat with thoughts more complicated than when he had left. 40. Sentence In a secret location of the capital in a dark room beside the EE's control centre, the Prime Minister sat on a desk. He waited patiently in a small room, blending into the dark. The only light came from a small light making a spotlight in the centre of the room. 
You know why I asked to see you? No, said a deep voice from the dark. The Prime Minister could only make the outline of his face. He looked up at the man, in the shadow, narrowing his eyes, trying to gather details. I've heard a lot about you. Your talents for killing, and your passion for murder, said the Prime Minister. The man stepped out of the shadow into the spotlight, eclipsing all the light from the room. The light above him cast a shadow upon his face, from his brow and nose, blacking his eyes and lips, giving him an evil appearance. Bestower looked down at the Prime Minister and inhaled. The stitches in his jacket stretched, sounding like little screams under the pressure of his chest. The Prime Minister tapped his finger on his lip with curiosity. I wouldn't call it murder, said Bestower, looking like the Grim Reaper's bodyguard. No? No, you have to be human first for that, said Bestower with a death stillness. True. Your corporal couldn't fulfil his duties, so you will take his place naturally. Bestower nodded so slightly. Not surprised, because he'd been given the orders anyway. Who else better, he asked himself. Death and destruction made him feel alive, and he was sure he could do a better job than the corporal ever could. The Prime Minister had expected Bestower to ask what had happened to the corporal, but the question never came. He shrugged his shoulders and walked to a small metal filing cabinet in the corner of the room, taking a file that was waiting on top of it. I have a mission for you. Does the name Harper mean anything to you? Yes, I met him in training, said Bestower, remembering him slightly, holding no feelings towards him. Bestower lacked humanity and couldn't form positive emotions and found it hard to form negative ones. He just didn't care about people. His only enjoyment was hurting, and it was the only thing that gave him something close to feelings. You like the man? It doesn't matter, said Bestower. Good. I want him dead, and his lady friend. Lacole? How do you know her name? said the Prime Minister. Bestower had seen her posters around the city, where his orders had been to terrorise, but where the streets had been empty. The only noise was often birdsong on the wind. With no distractions, he had noticed the environment more. Something was commonplace. A word, an image, an aura. Le coal. Posters of her were plastered to every wall and leaflets were on cars. Even within the EE, Le coal had gained a celebrity status. A revered one. They read her name daily and saw her image. Everybody knows about her, said Bestower. The Prime Minister hated his tone and felt threatened, not by Bestower, but by Le coal. Kill them, said the Prime Minister with hate, handing over the document to Bestower, who nodded and headed out the door. 41. Reason Message The courtyard, where the coal spoke a couple days ago, will not be safe tonight. Open your inbox to obtain information on danger zones over the next two days. Thank you. The coal, Chirac and Little Bella walked narrow streets deep in the city. Townspeople passed and noticed the trio with the highest of respect. The odd high five and occasional cheer met them as they walked smiling. Chirac served not just as a friend, but as a bodyguard. He deterred anybody from getting too close. As the happy faces passed, the coal smiled, but she noticed something she didn't want to see. They were struggling, it was undeniable. Torn clothes, greasy hair, dirt, all were attributes to the people. As she continued, a lone figure caught her eye. Stood in the centre of a narrow street was an old woman waiting for the coal. The woman was a moment of darkness, something still in a jubilant street. She noticed the sagging skin on the woman's boil-ridden face. She had paper-thin skin, with no colour, and the yellow bones behind her cheeks could almost be seen. The tip of her nose almost touched her lip, drooping downwards. She wore a black robe like a witch. The coal's eyes fixated on the woman, hypnotised and horrified, the woman's smile began to grow as the coal got closer. Miss Richards, said the woman with a toothless grin. The coal could see diseased gums that looked like they were bleeding. The coal imagined a corpse rising from the dead would look exactly the same as this woman. Now closer, her eyes seemed almost yellow too. The coal did her best to smile. 
Not long now, said the woman with a hiss. As the coal passed, the woman's face changed, and her eyes seemed to turn black as she snatched the coal's wrist. Her fingernails wrapped around her, jolting her back, knocking into Bella, making the little child fall. She leaned in close, and the water on her nose brushed the coal's cheek. She could taste her putrid breath in her mouth. Don't ignore me, bitch! Your days are numbered, said the woman with menacing eyes. Chirac grabbed the hag by the shoulders and threw her down hard. Her body hit the floor, slamming bone echoed onto the concrete. People on the street fell silent and watched. The old woman lay still, with her face hidden, and Chirac wondered if he'd been too harsh. Maybe she'd broken a bone. Then, she whipped her head around and gave Lacole a sickening stare that grabbed the pit of her stomach. Dead, 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 she said quickly. Chirac put an arm around Lacole and Bella. He was a cloak of muscle promoting them to move. As they walked, the old woman pointed an old bony finger. So dead, she said as they walked. The cold tried to ignore it, but the woman's sickening voice seemed to tear through the air and into her chest like poison. After some shopping and some other chores, the cold got back to Cavill's flat. She felt shaken, but tried not to show it. She had her first taste of unwanted attention. She put on a brave face, when Chirac asked if she was okay. She said yes and sent him home. She could show no weakness, not even to friends. At 6.30pm, she made a hot chocolate for Bella. She updated the website and after an hour, closed her laptop and walked into Bella's room. She was asleep on her bed with her favourite teddy bear. After kissing her on the cheek and pulling up her duvet, she went to her own bedroom. She took off her boots and stripped down to her underwear, keeping on her white vest. She climbed under the duvet and closed her eyes. The horrific face of the hag clung to her imagination, but something else denied her sleep. It was the tired faces of the people she was trying to protect, worrying she had offered too much hope to people that needed it so badly, offering a dream she didn't know she could achieve. Am I offering hope when it's hopeless? Butterflies in her stomach returned as she realised the hope of thousands of people weighed on her shoulders. What have I done? She couldn't sleep. Her bedside clock read 3.17am. She got up for a glass of water and slipped into comfy grey tracksuit bottoms and walked to the kitchen. After gulping down some H2O, she opened up her laptop at Carol's desk. Sitting there, she read back the emails and messages she had posted. Words like dreams and hope littered everywhere. Every sentence was a lie, she now thought. She had no idea how to achieve what she had promised, but she kept reading. Her emotions sank lower. It was like picking a plaster protecting a wound, opening the cut to hurt herself. She rested her head on her arms in the dark. The only light was from the computer, and it lit up her tears. The minutes passed, and she kept crying. Then she heard the door handle click. The door opened slowly, and she wiped tears away from her eyes. Harper entered, and saw the shine on her cheeks. What's wrong? asked Harper, walking in. Lacole sat up slightly, but her head was still down as she faced Harper. What have I done? She said, feeling her eyes well up again and tears running down her cheek. This time she didn't try to hide her emotions. It was the first time he'd seen her vulnerable. It didn't seem right. He felt like a child watching a parent cry. He wanted to help, but he wasn't sure how. You are making a difference, said Harper, trying to regain her confidence. Harper walked up to her, lowering himself to meet her emotionally, resting his hand on hers. The coal looked up as Harper brushed her hair behind her ears. How can I make a difference? I've promised too much. What have I done, Harry? said the coal desperately. Her voice sounded thin and her head went down between her knees. Harper put his hand on the back of her neck and spoke gently. Let me show you, said Harper. The Cole looked up at Harry's boyish smile with intrigue. He took her hand, pulling her up off the chair. He led her out the flat into the corridor. Harper's haste took her by a surprise as they trotted quickly down the corridor staircase in the dark, hand in hand. Harry, my shoes, said the Cole as he opened the door. Never mind that. He led her out the building into the silent night. The street was cold and dark, lit only by lampposts that lined the road. He led her ten metres down the street and turned left down a dark alley. Don't be scared, he whispered. Lucole couldn't see, 
but she could feel his smile. As they approached the end of the alley, something shimmered under the moon. A chrome blue motorbike. What do you think? He said, jumping on and giving the call that boyish grin again. Are you serious? Said the call, whispering for reasons she didn't understand. Get on, said Harper. The call's smile turned into a delicate laugh. Her head lowered as she told herself, OK. She stepped up, put her leg over and mounted the leather seat. She wrapped her arms firmly around Harper, feeling his body. She could feel the muscles on his torso, almost able to grip onto the curves. Where are you taking me? She said, resting her head on his back, closing her eyes. Home, said Harper, putting the key in the ignition. Harper drove through the streets of London, under the glow of the street lamps. There was a mixture of good and evil. A disease had taken over the city, but not all was infected. The infection of the EE and the symptoms were burnt cars and smashed windows. Harper turned street after street and saw more devastation and destruction. Occasionally, there were clean pavements, but they would turn to the next street and the vile destruction would be back. The city was dying, and if something wasn't done soon, the dread and the misery of the EE would take over and kill the whole way of life. Soon the glow of the city began to fade, replaced by a deep blue of the night. At the city's edge, stars began to appear. The bike roared up on a quiet motorway past oak trees that lined the road leading to the countryside. After 30 minutes, Harper slowed and turned left into a gravel car park in what seemed the middle of nowhere. He brought the motorbike to a halt killing the engine, and then took a moment to enjoy the silence. Nothing could be seen except the stars above them. Harper took Lecole's hand and led her across the car park to a wooden gate. She tiptoed with naked feet, and Harper let Lecole through first. He led her onto the grass and seemed to have a sixth sense of where he was going. They walked up a steep bank, and when they reached the top, Harper sat down, pulling Lecole down with him. They looked out at the night sky, and could see for miles. The horizon was purple, and looked like velvet cloud dissolving upon the stars. The stars were so vivid, like someone had spilled glitter onto the heavens. Below the velvet strip, white glitter glimmered and danced on a river. Lecole was speechless, and she stared at the wonder. The image affected her, like she was looking into another realm, a place of peace and tranquility, as though she had entered another world. Because of the torment, she had survived the last eight weeks. She forgot such beauty had existed. Sat there, time passed effortlessly. She watched the night sky turn to an ocean blue, and the stars fade as the sunrise came. Violet blended with orange and yellow, and the sky turned white. The coal smiled at the green earth below. Unsure how long she had been in the silence, she looked at Harper. He closed his eyes, feeling the sun on his face. How long has it been? said Lecole. Not long enough, said Harper, keeping his eyes closed. Lecole admired him. He was a wonderful man. You brought me to watch the sunrise. <laughs> a little cheesy, don't you think? said Lecole, as the sun lightened her hair to a chocolate brown. I didn't bring you to watch the sunrise. I wanted you to see what it rises upon. That's our reason, said Harper. They both looked at the countryside and watched a low fog fade away into the warm morning air, watching the river move with leaves in the nearby trees. It's beautiful, said Lecole. It's everything. It's what we're fighting for, said Harper, looking at Lecole. She felt a thousand dreams lift off her. She moved to him and rested her head on his shoulder. Harper put his arm around her and together they watched the sunrise and felt warmer in many ways. Again, time didn't make sense, but with the sun now casting light upon everything, they stood up. Lecole turned to Harper and looked up at him. Thank you, she said softly, tiptoeing and kissing him on the cheek. He watched her walk away and touched the place on his cheek where she had kissed him and smiled. To Harper, it meant nearly everything. They got on the motorbike and left, going back to the complicated reality they had created. 42. Fire Later that day in the centre of the city, 
a fire burnt on an abandoned construction site as the sun went down. Beside the fire was Iram, sitting on a metal bucket, warming his cold hands and coughing as the realities of living on the streets took hold. He burnt a box of leaflets he'd stolen, and on them he watched an image of the coal turn to ash. He took out the pistol he'd stolen from Harper and smiled. It wasn't easy, but he had found out where to find her. He'd asked around that day, and he knew it was time. He threw the entire box of leaflets on the fire and listened to the paper roar. He took a deep breath, stood up and concealed the gun in a waistband, hiding it in the ruffles of the grey blanket around him. Taking one last breath, he headed into the night. 43. Ripe. Harper listened to a lullaby coming from Bella's room, looking around Cowell's flat, feeling uneasy. The sofa was now decorated with red cushions. On the wall behind the sofa was an expensive canvas with a picture of a horse running on a beach hanging perfectly. The old rug in the centre of the room had been replaced with a new purple one, glowing with lushness. Harper went to Bella's room and watched true love resonate as the call kissed Bella goodnight, but felt uncomfortable with the call's comfort wondering if his message had been heard that morning. The call crossed the wooden floorboards into the living room, barely looking at Harper. He could feel her building a barrier. I saw a boy yesterday, said Harper. He was alone, curled up on the floor, cold and hungry. He was no older than Bella, said Harper. Did you help him? said the call, taking a seat on Cowell's desk and putting on a pair of glasses. Of course, but that's not my point. There are hundreds of boys and girls like that. Some even colder, more alone. Winter's approaching. We need to do something, said Harper, shutting Bella's door gently. We can't, said the coal, clicking the mouse, watching the computer screen. If you don't, blood will be on your hands. You have a chance to change everything. Can't you see that? What you and Cowell have done is amazing, but we need to take the next step. We need to fight. I can't do that, said the coal. Harper knew he was getting nowhere, sitting on the sofa and shutting his eyes. He wasn't angry, he was bewildered. The coal he once knew had seemed to have disappeared. He then heard tears, then a real cry gasping for air. Her hands shook as she held her face as true emotion poured from her heart, falling from her eyes. Her barriers were coming down, and Harper wasn't going to miss his chance. He stood up and knelt down beside her, holding her hands, preparing to say something he had never said before. I love you, said Harper, interlocking his fingers with hers. The coal looked at Harper and held his gaze as her tears stopped. You don't love me, Harry. I do. So much, said Harper, holding her tighter. Don't. Please look at me, said Harper. She looked hesitantly. I love you so much, said Harper, with hope and fear. That isn't fair, said the coal, trying to hold back her tears. I know they stole a part of you. Well, believe me, we can get it back, together. Maybe one day you could love me, said Harper, pulling himself closer to her cheek, touching hers. I wish I could said the coal, taking her hand away from his and resting them on her thighs. What's wrong? said Harper. It's... it's my mother. She was murdered when I was Bella's age, said the coal. Every time I look at her, I see me, a frightened little girl, and I think, if it was so hard for me growing up, what's it going to be like for her? That's why I can't love you. I... I don't understand. Because, until we do something about this, nothing else matters. Only that child. I'm fighting for her, and I'm sorry, but I can't risk anything. I need to make sure she's okay, said the coal. Harper stood up, trying to hide his frustration in his eyes. So we go back to Westminster, and we take back what is ours, said Harper, not understanding her, feeling cheated. The coal stood up and placed her hands on Harper's cheeks looking deep into his eyes, showing him her innocence. Harper tried to look away, but he was caught by her beauty. 
Violence isn't the answer. It never is. How can it be when we want something so pure? said the coal. She lowered his head and kissed him on the forehead, giving him a look close to love. Harper recognised the look. It was the same she gave Bella every night. At that moment, he knew the love she felt for him. It pained him. It wasn't the same love he felt for her. Lucole embraced him, then let go. Harper felt like he was losing something precious as she walked to her bedroom. She shut the door, and Harper stared at the door for ten minutes, thinking how the Prime Minister had ruined so many lives. He walked to his bedroom for another lonely night, only taking comfort in the thought she would be there in the morning. Forty-four. Dark. In a dark alley, a man looked up and felt raindrops fall from the night sky. His red headscarf covered half his face, revealing only focused eyes. He looked up, a guttering beside the building. It was vertical road pointing to his destination. He glanced at his side and saw a blue motorbike. It's the right place, he thought, putting his hands around the guttering. He pulled, testing its stability, giving it another yank. It stayed firm. He decided it could hold his weight, so he began to climb. Pulling hard on the guttering, he put his foot on the rough red brick wall. He pulled and climbed as his hands went up the guttering in the rain. Lightning lit up the sky and thunder roared, but his grip stayed strong like his unstable mind. He could feel an ache in his bicep, but hate kept him strong. He passed the second floor window and felt stronger as he closed in on his destination. The coal laid in bed, listening to the rain and thinking about Harper's emotional confession, making her want to cry again. She listened to the thunder and thought how everything had become a nightmare. Then she heard a light rattle with a scraping. It came from the outside, coming from her bedroom window. Lacole opened her eyes and watched the window. Her heart jumped as she watched the night sky light up and she heard the thunder then again a rattle. It was just outside her window. Lacole got out of bed and walked over the wooden floorboards. She tried to look out as the night sky flashed brightly again and then turned into darkness. The light revealed nothing, so she put her hands on the window ledge, then pulled up the window, letting in the night. She was hit by a blast of wind and rain and looked down into green eyes shining like jewels. She looked at a man hanging off the guttering. He focused on the coal. His eyes resembled a wild cat looking at its prey. Please, I need your help, shouted Iram. His grip was loosening on the wet plastic. Nicole could see the fear in his eyes and she reached out to him. She was stronger than she looked and pulled him up into her room. They both fell onto the wooden floor gasping and Iram got to his feet first. He took out the pistol from inside his robe and pointed it down at Lacole. Don't move, said Iram heartlessly. Lacole stood slowly, staring at the gun. She held up her hands innocently and looked down the barrel, half expecting the flash of light to end her life. Iram's eyes wandered around the room. He felt in control, empowered by the weapon. He nodded with a sarcastic approval. Nice place you got here. Warm too. You know, I've been sleeping on the streets, said Iram, inspecting the dark room. You don't get used to it, really. It is painful. Lacole said nothing. She tried to work out if she knew him. She had met over a thousand people in the last few weeks. What's wrong? Nothing to say? The great Lacole? Surely you've got something to say. Put your arms down, it doesn't suit you. You look pathetic. You're better than that said Iram. What do you want? said the coal calmly, with her arms still up. Ha <laughs> that's a good one. Aren't you supposed to tell me what I want? Then I get down and kiss your feet. That's how this works, isn't it? Go on, promise me a future, said Iram, spitting slightly, as irrationality showed on his face. I want that for everyone, said the coal. The simplicity and purity of her words tormented Iram. Shut up, he shouted pointing the gun with hate. What I want, you can't get me, said Iram, shaking. Try me, said Lakol, stepping slightly closer to Iram. He looked at her baffled, which quickly changed to anger. What if I want you dead, hey? Get me that, said Iram, 
The coal lowered her hands and gave Iram a sorrowful look. You can't get me what I want, because she's gone. I can't get her back, said Iram thoughtfully, lowering the gun, thinking about the girl he loved so much. He fought back to the moment he was taken from Florence, feeling his heart ripped out again. The day he was collected like cattle to the slaughter, he shuddered, remembering the blue of her eyes through the thick glass that denied him from hearing her last words. You're in love, said the coal. She tried to smile. Iram hadn't noticed. He then shook his head and remembered where he was. You've heard about that thing, have you? What did I do wrong? She was taken from me by people like you, said Iram. His voice quivered and his bottom lip jittered. People like me, said the coal, bringing her hands to her chest. A heartfelt belief in her innocence irritated Iram. Why are you here? You could have it all, but you don't. Does it make you feel good to be crowned the saviour? You're a fraud. Fraud? You're not the only one they've hurt, said the coal, stepping close to Iram, holding her hands to her heart. Shut up! You don't understand, spat Iram. The coal took another step and felt it was too far, but she wanted to break down his barrier. It's okay, said the coal, trying to offer hope. He stepped back and pointed the gun firmly. His eyes welled and a tear began to run down his cheek. You don't understand what it's like, said Iram. His chin quivered more than his hand. It's okay to be scared, said the coal, stepping closer again. Iram felt his emotions on the brink. He wanted to cry, but he held the gun firmly. It's not the same. <laughs> she was everything, whispered Iram, shaking wanting so badly to put down the gun, feeling frightened. His emotions were on a knife edge, and he wondered how he found himself in this position. He just wanted to go home. The wooden door to the room opened slowly, and there stood little Bella rubbing her tired eyes, peering into the dark. Le Col was... said Bella, stepping into the room. No! screamed Le Col, running to the door. Iram pulled the trigger. The bullet ripped through Le Col's neck. Her knees gave way and she collapsed to the floor. She held her throat gasping for air as Bella screamed. It pierced the walls and echoed through the building. She ran to the coal and Iram dropped the gun. He looked down at the little girl who held the coal trying to stop the bleeding pouring out of her neck. Her efforts were useless and he watched blood trickle through the floorboards. Don't cry, baby. Don't cry, said the coal, choking on her own blood, putting her arms around Bella. What have I done? whispered Iram, frozen. He felt a huge thud. Harper had tackled Iram, and now he was on top of him. Harper unleashed hate, smashing fists into his ribs and face. Stop, Harry! Stop! screamed Bella. When he looked up, the hate died instantly. Bella was crying, and she held the coal who stared hauntingly at the ceiling. My God! said Harper, jumping off Iram, who groaned in agony. Harper took the coal's cold body in his arms, and her eyes came back to life. It's okay, she shivered. Her voice was clear as she spoke, gently. Promise you'll look after Bella, said the coal. Her voice was weakening. Harper put his palm against her cheek and caressed her gently as tears ran down his face. Of course I will, he whispered. Harry, said the coal. Yes said Harper, knowing she was going to die. I love you, said the coal. Harper laughed through tears and then ran his hands through her hair, smiling at her for the last time. The coal's last breath faded away and her grip on Harper's hand eased. He watched her eyes dim as she slipped into an eternal sleep. Harper looked at her beautiful face, imprinting her within his mind. He reached for Bella and held her close, holding the most wonderful people in his life, feeling like the last objects on earth knelt down in the darkness, until it was disturbed by the sound of pain. The noise spilled fire into Harper's world, and his body burnt with rage. His head turned slowly and stared at Iram. He looked like a wolf in the night watching wounded prey. Iram shook, frightened by murderous eyes. They screamed death. Iram felt his vulnerability grow, 
and instinctively thought back to the gun lying on the floor between them. Cry it, said Harper, showing his teeth. Iram scrambled to his feet, not concentrating on Harper, who jumped up and ran towards him. As Iram lunged down, Harper swung an uppercut. It crashed into Iram's chin, sending his legs up into the air. He landed flat on his back. Harper watched Iram dazed on the floor, still reaching for the gun. Harper slammed his boot on his wrist, then picked the gun off the ground. He looked down and pushed the gun into his mouth, forcing it down Iram's throat, pinning his head against the floor. Iram choked, struggling to say something as metal pressed against his tonsils. What? screamed Harper in his face, pushing the gun harder, feeling the metal crushing the back of his throat. Iram's eyes began to roll in his head. Harper pulled the gun out quickly. What's that? shouted Harper as Iram gasped for air, gathering his senses. <gasps> I said do it, shouted Iram, gasping. His words shook as he cried. Pull the trigger. What are you waiting for? Iram said tearfully. You don't know what you've done. You're the man from the market. I should have let that mob kill you, said Harper. <laughs> Why take the pleasure from you? Just kill me. I killed the coal. Kill me, said Iram looking up. His face tensed like it could break. Harper leaned back, pointing the gun towards the ceiling. He looked at Iram and felt nothing. No, said Harper, quietly shaking his head. What? Why? said Iram. You don't even deserve to die. Not like this, said Harper, standing up and walking over to Bella. Harper stared down at Lacole's body and watched her blood ripple. It was from Bella's tears. The little girl he rescued needed rescuing again. He picked her up as she clung to Lacole's dead wrist. Let go, whispered Harper. Lacole's cold wrist hit the floor and it seemed to echo. Harper looked at Iram, who sat silently on the floor with his knees tucked tightly into his body. He began to cry like a child. Harper then heard the creak and could feel the presence of Chirac stood in the doorway. What happened? said Chirac deeply. His morbid tone echoed the spirit of the room. His calmness brought a stability that felt unnatural with so much spilled blood and a crying stranger. His presence entered the dark room. He walked towards Iram, who listened to the thuds of Chirac's boots. He stood over him, then calmly put his arm around Iram's collar. Chirac effortlessly dragged him out of the room. He didn't struggle as he was pulled through the blood. Chirac shut the door quietly behind him. Harper looked at the trail of Lacole's blood stretching out under the door and waited to hear Iram's screams. Forty-five. Break. Chirac looked down at Iram in the living room as a thin thread of light came in from the street through the window. Iram's head slowly rose. His neck ached as he looked at Chirac. Iram felt like he was looking at Goliath's bigger brother. He felt like David's pet puppy. Chirac breathed deeply in a trance. Iram stood cautiously. He heard Chirac's breath get heavier and saw his fist clench. Something between shame and fear made Iram feel the need to explain as he raised his hands. I want to, said Iram, as Chirac drove his fist into his gut and grabbed his shoulders and slammed him into Cowell's computer desk. The computer smashed under Iram's back and Chirac pushed his face into his. Why? roared Chirac. Subconsciously, his talon-like fingers had begun to choke Iram. Chirac pushed down his huge weight and it felt like a truck on Iram, as the legs of the desk creaked under the weight. Iram tried to get his fingers under Chirac's, but the man was like concrete statue that had been built around him while he slept. Iram felt his airwaves closing, as his heart felt pain. He released his grip on Chirac, and moved towards a more vulnerable area, the only place not protected by an inch-thick layer of muscle, his groin. Chirac felt Iram's hands run down his leg, and grabbed his arm at the bicep, pinning him flat against the table. Now Iram's head was free, he smashed his forehead into Shrak's face. The pain filtered through him. His threshold was high from a stabbing and gunshot memories. It touched his inner self so slightly. Shrak stood up and checked if his nose was broken, feeling the bridge for movement, still completely aware of Iram, aware that he'd stood up and was directly behind, also aware the knife tucked into his own belt. 
he also knew Iram's hand was still on the table. Shurak took the five-inch blade out of its leather holster, then, with his free hand, took Iram's wrist quick, like a golden eagle catching its prey. He slammed it back on the table, then raised the knife high. With all his might, he slammed the knife into the back of Iram's hand. Before Iram had noticed the pain, the blade had gone right through to the bone and vein, trapping his hand on the table. The blade wasn't visible. Only the handle could be seen, pressing against the bones in his hand. Not fully comprehending what had just happened, Iram pulled, and the skin ripped against the blade, making it bleed. He was stuck, and then the searing pain shot up his arm, all the way to his shoulder. Shurak stared at the man who whimpered in disbelief. The rain had stopped, and he thought about Harper and Bella in the next room. The door was still closed, so he presumed that they were still in there. But in his peripheral, he noticed the front door was open. He noticed someone was standing there. Someone dressed in black. Someone big. 46. Match. In the doorway stood the stower. Even in the dark, he stood out. He stepped into the room, followed by two EE guards. Well, 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 what do we have here? Fighting each other, as usual, I see, said Bestoa, looking around calmly. Shrak felt something alien to him. He was looking at a man in the eyes. He was used to feeling physically the most powerful, but Bestoa left him feeling human. Shrak pushed out his chest and straightened his back, trying to gain every inch. What do you want? said Shurak, glaring. Calm down now. We have good reason to search the place, said Bestower, picking up a coffee mug and looking into it, as if that somehow signified he was inspecting. You know you shouldn't be here, said Shurak, with feet shoulder width apart. Shut up. You two, search the place, said Bestower with authority obvious in his mind. Bestower hadn't seemed to notice the size of Shurak or the veins ready to burst in his neck. If he had, he didn't care. The two guards swiped at shelves and cupboards with their rifles, breaking coffee cups, laptops and books. Shurak noticed the old radio transmitter in the corner and feared they would break it. He backed up slowly towards the corner, trying to cover it. What are you hiding? said Bestow with intrigue. As he walked towards Shurak, it looked like two huge silverback gorillas had crossed territories. Everyone in the room sensed a fight was coming. They stood face to face, and even Iran watched in fascination. Move, said Bestower, expecting Shurak to comply like everyone always did. No, said Shurak, a word that sounded strange to Bestower. He struggled to decipher it, so he resorted to a tactic he was used to. He raised his rifle and pointed it between Shurak's eyes. You don't understand, said Bestower calmly. Shurak stared down at the barrel and breathed deeply. He wasn't going to move while he could still speak. Bestower's fingers twitched, ready to pull the trigger. Then a word was shouted by an EE guard, like an angel to Shurak's rescue. Harper? The guard pointed his gun at the once EE soldier, who stood in the entrance of the room where the cold light dead. Harper stepped into the room with his hands up surrendering. He recognised Bestower instantly. His back was hunched up by muscles collected at the top. Bestower turned slowly, and Harper recognised the evil in his face. You're under arrest, Harper, said Bestower with a smile. Harper stood in front of the evilest man he'd ever met, knowing any weakness could be his last mistake. Arrested? When did the law mean anything to you? said Harper. Perhaps the day you turned your back on your country. Your people said Bestoa, stepping towards the centre of the room. My country. My people. You're nothing of the kind. Everything fell silent. Then from behind Harper came the pitter-patter of tiny feet. No, Bella! shouted Harper in fear. The E guard instinctively pointed his rifle at Bella, and Harper instinctively grabbed his pistol tucked into the back of his trousers. He pointed it upwards and pulled the trigger. The shot hit the E guard in the forehead. Bella screamed. Harper knew he had precious seconds as he threw himself back into the bedroom. Bullets collided with the wall as he tried to protect himself. The bullets came from the remaining EE guard as he fired. Shurak lunged and tackled him with all his might. The bullets ceased as the men on the floor grappled for the rifle. Bestow was calm. He walked past the two men on the floor who fought and gave Iram a sick smile as he headed towards Bella. 
Chirac thought of everything this man symbolised. He heard the screams of his friends and family as he dug his fingers into the rifle with rage. It transformed into energy with a jolt. The rifle came loose from the guard's hands. Chirac smashed the butt of the rifle into the guard's head, knocking him out cold. His eyes rolled to the back and drool ran down his cheeks. Chirac got up but couldn't see Pistoa and didn't acknowledge Uram. Harper, it's clear, shouted Chirac. Harper slowly crept out with his pistol and did the same check as Chirac, looking carefully around the room. Where's the big guy? said Chirac. Where's Bella? said Harper. Iram, in agonising pain, with his head down, looked up at Harper. That big guy, he's in the other room. He took the little girl in there, said Iram, nodding at Bella's room, sucking in an excruciating agony. What do we do? said Chirac, holding the rifle in one hand like a pistol. We have to talk to him, said Harper. You want to negotiate, said Chirac. We don't have any other option. What do you suggest? That we allow him to live. Only if he gives us Bella, said Harper. On the floor, the eyes flickered of the E.E. guard, who was regaining consciousness. His fingers twitched as he raised his head and stared at the back of Chirac, who hadn't noticed. The E.E. guard reached down slowly to his black leather boot and took out a concealed knife from an ankle strap. He stood quietly. His eyes were fixated on Chirac's back. His black uniform acted like camouflage in the darkness. His steps made no noise as he approached like a murderous shadow. The blade caught Iram's attention, and with his free hand he pulled out the handle of the blade that trapped him to the table. He pulled hard, feeling the metal rip through the skin. Blood spilled out the knife, and it came free as he banished pain from his mind. The guard now stood behind Chirac, who watched Harper's face drop. Harper watched the blade rise, and he realised it was too late. Then the blade stopped. Harper couldn't believe his eyes. The guard began to gasp as a knife stuck out from his neck. Harper watched blood trickle down into the guard's neck. Chirac turned and watched the E guard fall to the floor, and standing there behind him was Iram, the saviour. This doesn't mean we're even, said Chirac. The three men looked at one another. Nothing was said, but mutality hung in the air as they surrounded the dead body of a common enemy. Harper, came Bestower's voice, creeping from behind the bedroom door. Careful now, his voice hissed, clinging to Harper's heart like a disease. They could hear Bella's whimpers. You know, this little girl's ruined your life once. How about we make her ruin it again? You know, she was meant to die that day in the street. Now, shall we fix what went wrong, said Bestower. What do you want? said Harper, staring at the floor. Bestower coughed, clearing his throat. <clears throat> right, this is what's going to happen. You're going to open this door and you're going to let me out. But remember, my gun is pressed up against her little head. Together we live. Together we leave. And I show her the sights of the city the tourists don't get to see. Do you understand? How do I know she's going to be okay? said Harper. You don't. But put it this way, I won't kill her. She's more use of life. It's your blood I want. Where's the coal? said Bestower. Harper's head lowered further. She's dead. Oh, the pain in your voice. That's good. See, you're just a drone with a gun. The coal, <laughs> she was the real problem. You're nothing now. I have a patrol car waiting outside. Now, open this door, slowly, said Bestoa. With all guns at the ready, Harper turned the door handle slowly. It moved stiffly and the metal clicked. Bestoa's evil face almost made him jump as he was right in front of them, smiling sinisterly. As the door crept open, he could see the gun pressed against Bella's head. The image was terrifying, someone so innocent wrapped in the arms of something so evil. His smile was like a snake watching for Harper's misery, wanting sick pleasure from his pain. Harper stood strong, pointing his pistol at Bestower's head. He didn't dare shoot, remembering the war in Africa, 
seeing a man shot in the head but surviving. If any man could take a shot to the face, it was him. Don't shoot, Chirac, said Harper, knowing this man had no soul. Hurry, I'm scared, said Bella wriggling in Bestower's grip. It's okay, it's going to be fine, I'm going to get you, don't you worry, said Harper, keeping his gun fixated on Bestower. Don't let him take me, why are you laying him? Please, stop him, cried Bella as Bestower stepped over his dead comrade, backing towards the door. I'm going to get you, said Harper. Bestower gave a last smile, then jolted into the corridor. They listened to his steps echo down the stairs and into the lobby, with Bella's screams all the way. The men stood in the darkness, trying not to imagine what would happen to the little girl. What? Why did you let him take her? said Iram, daring to break the silence. If you speak again, I will kill you, said Harper, looking at the gun he held, truly contemplating it. In the street, the patrol car flashed its light and Bestower jogged towards it. Bella kicked and screamed as Bestower threw himself into the back seat. What happened to the rest? asked the driver, looking at Bestower through the car's rear mirror. He wiped away sweat from his forehead, then glared. Insufficient training, said Bestower, looking for his seatbelt. The... the... dead? If you don't want to be dead, I suggest you drive. Now go. He got the message and started up the engine, pulling away onto the road. Are, are we going to call for backup? asked the driver. We don't need it. The coal's dead. They're like a beehive without its queen. It's now just a matter of time before they die, said Bestower, trying to get comfortable. Who's the little girl? Bestower looked at little Bella, who cried next to him, cowering in the car's corner. An old colleague will come for this one. Then I'll kill him, said Bestower. In the flat, they listened to the patrol car drive into the distance. Harper felt the eyes of Iram and Chirac on him. He felt a country's hope on his shoulders. The call was dead. He couldn't change that. He closed his eyes and tried to picture what needed to be done. But the image of Bella forced his way into his mind. He knew what he had to do. Something the call would have never have done. What now? said Chirac looking lost. Harper ignored him and walked to the room where Lecole was dead. Chirac, you know where the morgue is, said Harper with a stillness that could be mistaken for coldness. I do, said Chirac from the other room. Have Lecole's body taken there. Let nobody see you. Let no one. Understand? Of course. And what about him? said Chirac, pointing at Iram. Iram held his hand as blood dripped onto the floor from his wound. Harper squinted at him. What's your name? It, it's Iram. Iram? You see these bodies? said Harper, pointing at the EE guards that lay dead. Bury them. Understood? What, what about my hand? said Iram, feeling sorry for himself. Harper's squint turned into a frown as he marched up to Iram. If you hated Lecole so much, you must have admired these men. Give them a burial. Do you understand? said Harper an inch from Iram's face. Surely you're not going to let him live, said Chirac. He saved our lives, said Harper. But, but nothing. What the hell are you looking at? Move! shouted Harper at Iram. He didn't hesitate. He bent down and struggled to pick up the dead guard with one arm. Harper and Chirac watched him struggle with the corpse. Then Harper looked at Chirac. We need all the help we're going to get if we want to win. Win? Win what? said Chirac. The war, said Harper. Chirac wrapped the coal's body in bedsheets and kissed her goodbye. He put his arms under her cold body and carried her out the room. He passed Iram dragging a body down the stairs. Chirac carried the cold so delicately. He left the building and walked under the cover of night. Harper sat on a chair in the corner of the room, staring at the radio broadcaster. He contemplated how to crush future thousands of people and keep the humanity. He switched a switch, a green light turned on, and he leaned close to the microphone. 
to all that listen to me on this night. He gripped the microphone hard. The words wouldn't come out. She was worth more than an announcement in the middle of the night. Meet me tomorrow at 12 midday at Trafalgar Square. I need to tell you something. Something important. Thank you. He flicked off the green light and finished with his simple broadcast. He contemplated saying more, but knew his voice had said so much. The city had come to expect the comforting voice of the coal. The fact it wasn't her would send shockwaves. He knew the message would have hit the social network, and people would speculate why the coal had not spoken on the radio. The talk would be rife. People would fear the worst and hopefully bring the biggest crowd yet. Enough blood had been spilled tonight. Harper would wait until tomorrow to break more hearts. Then he would try to offer them a new kind of hope.